insects, then you've got to go to a higher dose. If I remember, it's 200 and 450, depending on what you're looking at. But that means physically you'd have to run at two or 300 to ensure that the center of the box reached the minimum. This is for dragon fruit and mangosteen, or are they going to be, there's probably separate protocols, right? No, yeah. uh, Peter has spent a lot of time over the last 15 years or so looking at general dose rates for fruit flies as one group, uh, which is our major concern because it's an internal pest. And then he has other insects where the data is, requires a higher dose. And I think it's around 450 grays, whereas the other one is 200. Now don't hold me to this uh, and I'll buy you the beer if I'm completely wrong, but um, that's what it is. It's generally 200 for fruit fly, 150, 200 for fruit flies. And then, and this is applying to all fruit as far as I know. Uh, but I could be wrong on that aspect. But for dragon fruit and long gun, yes. I'm, I'm looking it up right now uh, with Peter's um, dragon yeah, fruit. Peter is, has uh, one with um, uh, an article with. Uh, uh, t, uh, the radiator guy on Big Island. Um, a Weiner? Weiner, Eric, Eric yes. Yeah. I have a paper. And so the, the, I have um, the 2020 quarantine update from Peter Follett. Uh, dragon fruit is 150 grays and post-harvest dip or orchard treatment for control of surface pests or 400 grays to control surface yeah, index. Uh, it's 150, index. 400 then. Yeah, and what was the other fruit? Mangosteen. Mango, mangosteen. Mangosteen is also 150 and 400, it's same thing. pretty much for all of the fruits we're looking at. Yeah. Peter's done very good work on this, um, bringing this all together and becoming much more uh, general in their recommendations instead of having a fruit by fruit variety by variety requirements, which we used to have about 20 or 30 years ago, which were a nightmare to deal with. Uh, so I really think we have to recognize Peter for his actions in, in bringing this down to a more sensible approach, addressing our quarantine. Yeah, this file is is uh, on the web on our new website. You know, listed under Peter's uh, video or at the bottom, I forget, so that you could download the latest uh, list of fruits and what's required for them. So Adam. Adam, did that answer your question, Adam? He's still muted. So I guess my question, a follow-up question to this is in terms of export um, and irradiation, I guess two separate questions. Is there much of that going on? Or is there any more growth going on with regard to irradiation and export? Well, I could only speak to the Kunir operation and they're exporting whatever they can. Most of it is papaya, but they're also doing crops and various other commodities. We've been working with them on actually moringa leaf exports, uh, where they have a slightly different problem, but they will irradiate whatever they can get needs to be done. Uh, but their major one is in fact, um, the uh, papaya. Okay. All right. So moving on, Eric Horn has a question uh, with regard to CARES Act money from the state and the counties to address impacts uh, that are affecting our industry. Uh, who wants to take that question? Well, we got some that that uh, from two. Uh... You, you worked on the initial uh, SBA CARES Act fund. And then we just, the uh, County of Hawaii had a thing where they covered uh, uh, companies' costs for insurance, salary, and utilities. So we received another 6,000 to support HTFG, which does make it a lot uh, easier for it. None of it really, um, there are other loans out there, but none of it really is uh, applicable to uh, HTFG's uh, mission. 
so they 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 get money to help us along because we but that's uh that's pretty much it so i i'll add a little bit i know sharon heard has been kind of like a clearinghouse and sending out information to to direct farmers um, and to infant organizations. So I know she's been providing a lot of stuff. I've been trying to forward that out to our membership in email blast. I know Eric, you had a question with regard to infrastructure um, uh, changes. You want to explain? Yeah. Um, so I know that the CARES Act, it has, it's supposed to be all related to unforeseen impacts and challenges as a result of the pandemic, but there's a broad leeway in terms of how that money can be spent. That's why the city and county of Honolulu spent, went out and bought new police cars, new police ATVs, et cetera. So in some ways for at the county and the state level, we have a lot more leeway if we were to go and lobby our representatives to help our industry out, to help us meet the needs of, you know, like supporting things that may have become more popular, the community supported agriculture models and stuff like that. It seems like those would be venues and avenues we could get them to, you know, spend some of that unspent 200 million on us before it goes poof at the end of the year. And I know Sharon is telling us what's coming down from the federal level, but I'm wondering if we have had much engagement, you know, to really start sending some of the money our way, like Ken has mentioned through the wage reports, but it seems there's opportunity beyond that that we should be pursuing. Well, part, part of our county is pretty proactive. So uh, we received funds to uh, do a master food preservers class in Kona. Uh, at least we will once our COVID plan is approved. And the same for uh, Deb Ward wrote a conference grant for East Hawaii. And uh, once that's approved too, uh, we can move forward. So they're, uh, they're using what they can, I guess. I mean, I do understand what you're saying, Eric, in terms of there are other models that, that out there that uh, uh, might better help farmers like CSAs, et cetera. But those programs are in place. And so the money would already be um, going out to those specific agencies or companies or groups that are doing the CSAs. So how to get that to HTFG, it doesn't make sense because we're not gonna have an HTFG CSA. Well, it's not just to get it directly to HTFG, but to really make sure that the industry as a broader whole actually sees you know, some of the relief money that has been set out. So it, it could be things like, if you can buy, a, if the city and counties can buy police cars, why can't they buy you know, a tractor that then can be rented out to various you know farmers as they need and then but held in title by the state department of agriculture these are the kind of questions that i'm wondering why it seems there is no thought or execution being put onto it i mean I, I use a tractor as an example but it might be more the tools that people need for you know essentially selling their product in a socially distanced environment or producing the product better i mean it, it could also this Federal money, it's always kind of wishy-washy, but it could be just to address the problems we already have had before. And I don't see where else the money's coming gonna come from because our state budgets always kind of shaft the Department of Agriculture. So Yeah, Noah, have you looked at this for the co-op? Do we lose Noah? Yeah, still here. What was the specific funding? Well, Karen, uh, like I know you guys just got a huge grant, but was that cares no that was yeah just the kind of standard usda yeah i mean other than the the you know employment protection program the initial monies um the small businesses i don't think they've gotten any actual cares money um their strategy has been to track the cares money and contact the recipients <laughs> and then sell them breadfruit. <laughs> um, <laughs> be like, hey, you just got, you know, a half a million dollars for a feeding program, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, if you buy from us, that money has further impacts in the community and yada, yada. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been their strategy, but not, I, I mean, I know Donna's been looking, um, but from what I've heard from her, yeah, they haven't really 
had any relevant programs come out um, that they could even apply to. Yeah, thanks. Hey, could I uh, throw something in here? You know, yesterday it was announced that the state was handing out $500 gift cards that could only be used at a local restaurant. And the, the fact of the matter is the state is struggling to disperse all of the CARES money that it's been given by the end of the year. Otherwise, they have to give it back. So I think there would be an opportunity to do a similar program uh, whereby a gift card could be used to buy only directly from a farmer or a farmer's market. So uh, that's just an idea. Thank you. Write it up, Matt. As administrator, you get 10%. <laughs> so, so I think what's going on is there is a lot of money throwing around with this COVID stuff, but I don't think it's well planned and well coordinated. And, you know, our leadership with regard to agriculture, um, if we take a look at it, you got the state um, department of agriculture, you know, we got a little bit of support from them. We got Senator Gabbard um, and then we got each of us in our own capacity, but I would say it's very disjointed. It's not well coordinated and the money seems to be going to those that have the best uh, political connection and the best wherewithal. And I don't think we're, on the front seat of this one. So I would agree, Eric, um, we're, we're not as powerful as we could be. Um, it's gonna, I, I, don't know who, I don't know what to do other than we can talk to Gabbard, we can talk to, the, I don't know where the university is, Rob, Robert, on, on getting this kind of money. I know they're doing money to train people to be testers um, for contact tracing, but in terms of food security and food safety, um, that seems to be a big issue, but we haven't really been really proactive uh, about doing this in uh, building the infrastructure and our capacity. Anybody want to comment? Well, you know, in my perspective, in my, in my industry, you know, sometimes a lack of uh, organization is an opportunity for somebody that wants to pursue hard something. So I, I would not say, I would not see, um, you know, the lack of uh, organization and uh, thinking as, as a deterrent. It's, it's, you know, it's an opportunity to, to get there, you know, if you, if, you, um, if you go to the right channel, the right person. So um, it's a matter of sometimes having, you know, two people, one person, you know, pursuing it like, uh, like crazy, you know, and, and, and taking advantage of that lack of organization from the, from the funding, from the funding perspective. That's my comment, general comment, nothing to do with, uh, with food or uh, agriculture, but you know, I'm, I'm not in the agriculture per se, I'm, I'm uh, more in aerospace, but you know, sometimes you, you, you take advantage of that non-organization, if you want, of you know, government or state, and, uh, and you take that to your advantage. I, I would agree. I think that's the theme that's going on here. We're kind of in a chaotic environment and those sitting around waiting for something to resolve it, it's not going to happen. I think you, it's a time to be proactive. There's lots of opportunities out there, but I think, you know, there's an expression I try to go by on a daily basis and, and it goes like, if it is to be, it's going to be up to me. So, you know, we're going to have to be proactive and, and do what we can at our end and then pull collaborators wherever we can. If you're waiting for the other guy, I, I think it's going to be really hard. All right, so let's move on. I have a question from Noi here. Um, Noi asking more detailed questions about the operation of the greenhouse. In particular, you know, what are the protocols that we're, we are establishing to make sure that we're keeping things uh, disease free? What happens if we do have a, a disease breakout, um, and you know how do we we manage that? Ken. Yep. So, Noe, the um, uh, first of all, there <laughs> there is air circulation. There's um, one ten and fans in each room to keep the uh, the flow. Uh, we've got by the use of uh, shade cloth on the roof. We've got the temperature to. Um, with, there's a sensor. First of all, there's a sensor in each room that is um, Wi-Fi back to the hub, which is can be on my desk right now. It's sitting outside, but uh, that tells me the the temperature and relative humidity in each chamber. 
<laughs> so um, each of the eight chambers are controlled by um, by airflow or by the type of uh, uh, emitters, whether it's a fogger, sprayer, or mister. Right now, we've set most of them up with uh, a propagation system with foggers, where it it fogs every uh, for 10 seconds every 10 minutes. Um, this is just to test the system and the Galcon timer. So once we know, have a specific crop, then I get to bug Robert Paul again and say, okay, what's the best relative humidity for uh, Bacaria angulata, for example, or, or for durian? So since there's already a lot of data. So that, that chamber is set up with the right temperature, which can be controlled through the use of shade cloth. But right now the temperatures are between 90 and 95 and they simulate a uh, tropical rainforest, you know, uh, Amazonian or Borneo rainforest. And those are most of the crops that we'll be bringing in. So I think that, um, you know, getting, getting uh, it, it really depends on the species. Each room can be controlled independently with the type of water, amount of water, uh, the amount of light and um, the amount of uh, uh, humidity or temperature that that's, uh, we, we can create. So it's really sp species specific. If somebody rents a room, uh, they're welcome to follow the protocols for working in the greenhouse, you know, with the foot washes and, and um, opening and closing of doors and going through the blackened areas, et cetera. Um, so that's all, uh, that's pretty much all set. So it's just, uh, who wants to wear in a room for 5,000 a year besides Joe, who's, uh, who wants to, we have one, one member who wants to rent a room. Does that answer it, Noe? So sorry, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I wanted to know, are we the ones responsible for maintaining? Like, are we going in to check on these plants or is the renter responsible? Um, it, it, it's up to the renter. I mean, I don't mind. I mean, I'm looking out the window at the greenhouse now, behind, you know, it's behind me. Um, so I don't mind checking, but the, the, the system is all automated. So by I can control it by you know pushing buttons on the on the timer or uh, changing or moving fans or and speeds uh, or blades. Um, so everything is is relatively uh, automated and and uh, easy to control. Uh, one of the the temperature concerns I had and why I refused to blacken the walls in the rooms was because it brought the temperature up over ninety five and it becomes a, you know, a, a breeding ground for nematodes. So all of these plants are inspected prior to entry by uh, the USDA. And when they pass that, then they come to the greenhouse. So, um, which is, 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 is uh, really well quarantined in its own right, you know, with moats and 15 foot concrete buffers and, uh, Buy stock in Clorox now, that's all I can tell you, because uh, we have to wipe down and sterilize everything all the time. But that's that's fine, that's part of it. So the renters, it's the renter's option. You want to come and do it once a month, once a week, every day, that's okay as long as you follow the correct protocols for entry. Whether you want me to do it, that's fine. Just tell me what you want, tell me the humidity you want, tell me the temperature you want in there. Are they paying extra for that service? No, not really. Seems like a lot, a lot of work for 5,000 for a whole year to be watching somebody's trees and taking care of any, well, you know, I mean, I know it's automated, but you know how it is, the irrigation, something pops out or. Yeah. Well, and then I would think the liability, right? If you're mm -hmm. taking care of them and something happens, right? right. The customer might be pretty. Uh, well, part of the agreement, which we haven't written up yet would be that we get some of the trees too for each of our repositories. So um, my goal is really, you know, by doing this too, is to have these things here 
to build the repositories that we have, you know, two acres on each island. You know, whether it's at Noe's place or Brian's place, I mean, we have this, these um, repositories uh, for the unusual trees. So in other words, um, Noah, I need, you know, like five different species of breadfruit from you times seven for each repository. And, and we'll plant them out and use uh, Eli's techniques for propagating and, and, and make them available. And eventually, over time, it's going to, you know, there's no instant gratification anywhere in this business. So it, it takes uh, time. I mean, we all wish we were 24 again, although I think no way is 24. It's, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, um, okay. I just, yeah. I just worry, you know, like, yeah. like you Noah know, said with liability, like I, yeah, I just hope, hope it works out. Yeah. Between Brian and I over here, um, and Peter Follett is, is going to be our entomologist. So I think we're, we're pretty well, um, pretty well covered. And yeah, it's for two years. So, um, I, you know, I just have to make it that long. I need a vacation from retirement is what it comes down to. Uh, so and like, like what if, Ken, what if you get hurt again, like you did this year? Do we have backup plan? Like if you're taking care of this? Yeah, his name is Brian. Okay. Yeah, uh, Levens, who's probably pretty good. And Eli lives in my, my building along the road there. And Eli knows his stuff, as Noah will attest. And um, I think... Um, it seems like if we're problem. offering to take care of the plants, we should have a paid someone like who's respond, you know, not just doing it if they need something well, to yeah. think about when you're doing the agreements, I guess. Yeah, so maybe I should ask you to, to uh, write it up. <laughs> no, not a lawyer, but <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lauren, as, as what success would be uh, like in the greenhouse and Basically, Lauren, just like it was when you purchased the mangosteen from us, you had to wait for it to go through quarantine. In those days, you the HDOA would just approve your land, and you okay, you can bring something in from the Philippines and put it there, and have a boundary. Well, they changed that to where it has to come into a quarantine greenhouse. So it's the same thing. You want to buy another a uh, couple dozen mangosteen, you have to wait until it comes out of quarantine. And then we just move it out into, into um, the general nursery area and send samples to our repositories. Um, so if we can bring in, you know, 2000 durian in one, one room and have those uh, growing out for two years, uh, grafted durian from the Philippines, <clears throat> um, I think uh, you know it's going to be very successful for a lot of farmers. That in eight years, people will be those two thousand pretty um, two thousand trees or whatever it is would produce a substantial amount for export. I mean, Thai Town in L.A. wants a container of fresh durian in a week. So, and there, and it's not that big of a greenhouse. It's about the size of yours. It's, I think twenty four by twenty four. What ours? is 30 by 30. A 30 by 30. That's a little bit. And eight rooms. So uh, relating to the greenhouse again, this is a new endeavor where our initial plan um, kind of got blown up because our cost to produce this is to create this greenhouse is much higher than we anticipated. The revenue side, our numbers haven't really been tested yet, but you know this thing's going to have to pay for itself. Right now, it's just a money pit. We're just dropping money like mad into this thing, and we haven't generated much revenue to support it. But you know that's going to be one thing. We have to make it sustainable. The other thing is we have to make sure that we're covered uh, in case of the what if scenarios that that keep coming up, and we can recover if there are any uh, things that don't go according to plan. We're out in new, new, new territory, so 
you know, we don't have a lot of contingency built into this thing. So that's, that's a danger as well. We'll find out in time, I'm sure. I'm looking for questions. I don't see any more questions in the chat room. Yeah. I'm going to put in a, at this point that all of the board positions are up. We do um, a change of our board or we have an election, a new election of our board at the end of every conference. So this is the end of our conference here. So I've asked the existing board if they want to re-up. I've had three replies so far. And any, I'm taking nominations from anybody here in this meeting or if they want to nominate themselves or anybody else in, to sit on our board. We'd like to have representation from each of the chapters. And we can have, our bylaws say we can have up to 15 members. We've never had that many but we do need to have our board. We plan to have an election after this by email of all of our membership. And then we'll have an organizational meeting probably later this month or early next month to elect our officers. So Eric, you've just been nominated. Eric Horn. Thank you. What, uh, what island, Eric? Eric's on Oahu. You'd be a great contribution. I'm going down to the questions here. So um, Mark White asks a question, anything about the Queensland Beetle? No, I'm asking Mark. Oh, you're asking me. <laughs> Mark. <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, well, uh, Shana Sim gave a presentation on that as part of the meeting, right? And I guess that's the most up-to-date stuff. Um, as far as I know, I mean, look, what they've done is... ...different issues, and she, she will not respond to my email. Sorry, what was that? She's the secretary for the... I don't know what that was. Um, so they've, they've looked at trapping methods so that you can actually monitor the thing. Um, and I guess long-term, there may be a, an effort to look at biocontrol, but right now, there's no real um, effective way to control them other than perhaps um, perhaps screening on certain things. The thing is they're very prolific, so they attack multiple species, um, which makes it really hard. There's no specific control options. Um, but Shana would be the one to contact and ask. I think she knows way more about it right now than I do. How's that for a non-helpful answer? <laughs> well, you're just dancing around like a politician. I try to answer the question, though. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know. I didn't look at Shana's whole presentation, but um, check it out. Okay. So Adam has a question with regard to palm oil um, and what its potential is, perhaps on the Big Island. Anybody? I can add to that question about what's going on with regard to palm oil. No idea. Never heard of it being produced on the Big Island. Adam, you want to elaborate? Uh, the Malays once approached us to actually do some trials here because we didn't grow it commercially. Um, <clears throat> uh, they wanted actually a site to put in genetically engineered palm oil. Sorry. One sec. But that fell through. Basically, the answer I'm getting to is that, uh, there's no reported production on the island. It's not that there's no trees here. Uh, it's just that there's no um, commercial production. How about Ken Yamamura, anything on Maui? 
with palm oil. Well, I'm not with the county now, but uh, I have no idea of any palm oil operation or any plans to do it. <laughs> okay, that I guess we can answer that question. Um, one of the things I want to bring to everybody's attention is we do have a new web, uh, a website and a membership uh, database, and we have um, David Duchet to thank us with that. And that should be coming out it's partially unveiled already, and we'll send notices to everybody on the new system uh, through emails. And we're going to have to have everybody chime back in um, to fill in the database uh, for that new system. So, you know, membership's gonna be all renewed in the new system. So be on the lookout for that. They'll be getting some emails on the new system for you to get yourself re-registered. This new system's integrated, which helps us a lot. So that will, uh, should help communication with everybody in the membership, should connect everyone, keep the data there. We'll hopefully get more surveys out to the members to find out what's, what's working, what's not working. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. Ken, you want to build on a little bit more of that? Well, we to our new it's data not yet. I think we just have to wait until Dave has more of it until we make the migration to the new platform so that now htfg.org still goes to the old platform. So once that migration is done, that's when we, we got to get everybody on board. I, I wanna anyway, it's a modern... Uh, website and uh, app. Ken, uh, Mark, and the others on the committee, I want to thank the committee for the excellent website associated with the program for this conference. I mean, it was very well done. And it was relatively easy to move around, even to someone like me. And, but I just wanted to compliment the, the association for what they did in putting this together. Thank you very much. Just because you're in you, second. Everybody. Second place behind Gabe for the most views. I don't know. Yeah, well. You didn't expect that. <laughs> so Gabe, Ken has a um, question for you. What are your five picks for resistance to bungee top? Most resistant. Um. Well, it depends on what the end use of the plants are and the fruit. There's the, and, Just the and you can't have it all. Basically, the best ones for bungee top are the worst for fusarium. Um, and there's more, a few growers having issues with fusarium here on Oahu, and they want, they switch to the bungee top tolerant ones, but are now having issues with fusarium, and they don't want to go back to the fusarium tolerant ones because they have issues with bungee top. Um, so, but for bungee top specifically, uh, the Bluefields Gros Michel cultivars are very good, um, as are the Peace Hang a Walk cultivars. Um, those have the most commercial potential. Uh, beyond that, there is a number of other things that are okay, um, but nothing phenomenal. Um, however, I believe that having bungee top resistance is, or tolerance is a nice feature, but it is not essential. And um, with a shift of mindset on how to cultivate bananas, uh, you can grow almost any variety, even with high bungee top pressure. So what about that high gate uh, tissue culture one that uh, Richard uh, you know, Dr. Manshart distributed a lot of tissue cultures, so we we got them out to all of our repositories and anything. It's I know it's a grand name, isn't it? Basically, no, Gros Michel. Gros Michel. That's yeah. one of the, that's one of the Gros Michel Bluefields. It's a dwarf Bluefields, dwarf Gros Michel. Okay, what do you think of it? Um, 
It's pretty good. Um, it, I think, is better suited as like a backyard variety um, rather than commercial production. Because even though it has the potential for large bunches, um, Looks like we're having trouble with connection with Gabe. Hmm. Yeah, well, he's he's been having connection trouble. I see his image getting locked up. Oh, sorry. Oops. <laughs> now I got okay. lost. Can you hear me now? Yep. Sort of. All right. Maybe I'll go outside. I might have better connection. You're good now. Okay. Um, should I repeat my answer about the Highgate variety? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, I think it's better suited as a backyard variety compared to other dwarf grummy shells such as Cocos because the has the bunch sizes are relatively equal and it has more fruit, but they're smaller fruit. Um, and it doesn't produce uh, cakey as frequently or as quickly. Uh, so the mats stay smaller, but for production, that means that they're slower to refruit. Okay. Um, but it's a decent variety, but then it's susceptible to fusarium, susceptible to cigatoka. So, you know, you gotta pick your poison, I guess, pick your battles. Um, Deb wanted to know about Namwa, if that's uh, pretty tolerant. Yeah, that's the, the Pisanga Wak Namwa is just another name for it. Okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're fairly tolerant. Uh, they'll still get it, um, but it's just a, you know, matter of pressure and time. Uh, but the other thing too that I notice a lot is even if folks don't have issues with bunchy top, they tend to have issues with uh, corm weevils and with nematodes um, that might not even show up on the radar until it's too late as far as noticing that it's a problem with the plants. So you can kind of take care of corm weevils, nematodes, and bunchy top by frequently replanting with uh, clean plants. Um, so, and if you're diligent about that, you know, you can, most varieties are pretty growable. Changing locations every five years, like all the old Filipino farmers here seems to work for, you know, like um, Ele Ele and, um, you know, Haikea and some of the old uh, Hawaiian types as well as Lakatan and Balayang and the different Filipino bananas. Yeah, you, you can do it, you can view it that way or just view it as like always having a new place to plant. Um, yep. You know, it doesn't have, five years I would say is like pretty long time to expect them to stay in one spot anyway or like that you should get production or that you should move them every five years. Um, yeah. Like for varieties that I want to continue to grow that are highly susceptible, um, I'll plant a new crop every two months wow. and just Great. keep replanting. But the thing is, you know, it, that sounds kind of drastic, but in reality, it's pretty much the same strategy and the same um, time frame as something like taro. So you know, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think anybody would be up in arms about having to replant taro. No, <laughs> that's fine. Um, and you look traditionally, especially in the Pacific with Pacific varieties, almost all of them are grown with those root crops and shifting gardens anyway, uh, because that's how they respond best. Yeah. Thanks. So we have a question here. Um, I think it's Jordan asking this. Um, any uh, availability and status of new Anona varieties? And I answered a, a little bit below that we've uh, got some Salzmani seeds and, and trying to grow that out. But, you know, it's almost impossible to get things from Brazil. Once the new greenhouse is operational, I'll work with uh, 
Jim West, Antonio, and Marco to get things one from Brazil to Ecuador and be able to get our Fido from Ecuador, um, hopefully with some plants, as well as Anona seeds. I don't know, Bob Holzinger maybe can answer some of that. I was going to ask him about Cherimoya anyway, if there's anything new in that world. No, nothing really what I consider new, but um, I'm reconfirming something that I was told years ago when I first started growing cherimoya. Uh, the old the old growers back in the 80s when I first started used to tell me, yeah, grafted varieties are nice because you know what you're going to get, but in their experience, seedlings tend to be more self-fruitful. And Obviously, if you don't want to go out and hand pollinate all your cherimoya flowers all the time, it'd be nice to have a variety that's more self-fruitful. So what, what I've been telling people to do is find someone who's growing a variety that you like, get some seeds from them and plant the seeds. That works. And in, in my experience, my limited experience, the seedlings don't take that much longer than a grafted tree to start flowering. So. Yeah, we'll see. I just grafted uh, a bunch of uh, Cherimoya scion and, and just planted a bunch of seeds at the same time. So we'll see. It's a race. Yeah, and as it, as it is right now, um, SCREC does not like to give out any scion wood anymore. Hmm. I mean, there are some in the experiment stations, at least in Kainaliu, I've seen them, and in, um, on Kauai many moons ago. And Bob, I don't know if you can, that's something you can uh, find out if there's a maps to each of the experiment stations and what kind of germplasm would be available at four bucks a stick, according to your friendly dean. Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Robert, is that something I'm you not gonna, I'm not going to really answer that because I really don't know the status of this distribution. Um, whether or not it's going to be finally approved by the university attorney, I have no idea. It, it has some problems in distribution, but you have to understand the college's problem. And that is uh, <laughs> COVID-19 has in fact caused serious problems in funding. Uh, we have lost a lot of positions and we have to recoup in some way. The problem was we never developed a licensing program 20 or 30 years ago when it was discussed. Uh, we still don't have one for even anthuriums and orchids. So it's a rather big minefield within the college. Um, yep. I can't do much about it. And, and I don't know if anything will be done. Uh, there are maps of the original plantings for Waikea, for Moho, and Waimanalo that I know of. The Maui ones have probably been changed dramatically. Uh, the maps, however, for let's say for Moho may not be very current because we lost 50% of our land and some of the varieties were on that land. And also a fire went through and destroyed a number of, of trees in that area. But why I care should be pretty much the same as it was in the past. Yeah, I have the map for Kainaliu and I have made additions and corrections. Thanks to that one program where we planted the little arboretum there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, we're growing out a lot of the material that is it kind of you that people you know our members want to have the different avocados so you know we have 65 gallon pots filled with avocados that are pretty much only for scion so we keep them low just to get the scion each year and and make that available to members and that is a a, a perk of membership that eventually it'll be on the new website that you can order these you know, scion for, you know, 20 different avocados when it's ready and pretty much only shipping cost. The, um, 
the introductions that were made to the college from, I think from the 1950s onwards, there was a book which indicated what the variety, what the species was, what the actual name was, and where it was collected, and who brought it in. Mm. That book has apparently been lost. Um, so, though the names are probably correct on the material on the stations, the origins are probably tied up in someone's brain somewhere, and may be difficult to work out. Yeah, interesting. Well, we've made, uh, like with the poster, we've made certain assumptions based on, um, especially for the, the Japanese name varieties, you know, going to the <laughs> local Honganji and who, were, who was friends with who, who married who. So if you had to choose between, uh, oh, is this a Yamagata or a Nishikawa, and you find out that, well, one of the Egi sisters married Yamagata and the other married in Ishikawa and so this is you know anyway it's it's convoluted but but interesting to uh, source out this history. Mark go ahead. I want to I want to go back to something that Bob Halsinger said and this is from a practical standpoint with regard to selecting of, of cultivars and someone might have uh, a particular cultivar that does really well in some location that they rave about, but does it really do well in your location? And I think what you came up with, which is really practical, is if you have some kind of fruit that you really like, does it really grow in your environment or not? And an easy way to try it is get a bunch of seeds and you get a little bit of a variation there. And out of the five or six seeds that you plant, you might find something that does pretty well. You can couple that with maybe grabbing a particular uh, sign wood or grafting some stuff that you know does really well in another location, but it's really unproven in your location yet. So I kind of like that idea. I don't, um, I think that's a good way to go forward. Um, you know, instead of putting a lot of effort on what someone else had some success with, maybe a little bit of getting some variation with seeds makes sense. Bob, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Which Bob? Well, there's been a lot said about planting seeds versus grafted trees here. And of course, um, in California, we, we don't have as much land usually uh, individually to experiment with seedlings. So we're, we tend to be backyard growers and have limited space. So everybody's looking for something that fits in a little bitty space. And so they tend to go with a grafted tree. But really, there's, there's a lot of advantages to having seedlings sometimes. Uh, you do get a more a vigorous tree if that's what you want. Again, in a backyard, sometimes vigorousness is not the key asset that you're looking for. But um, I, I think that you have to remember the only way a new variety is developed is to be the seed. And quite often, uh, new varieties are superior to the varieties that you have. And just from my example with Chiramoya, people have found that by and large, if you have a very good fruit that you like and you plant the seeds from a Chiramoya, you're probably going to get a tree that's going to have a very nice fruit. So, I mean, that's somewhat the name of the game. Of course, in, in the case of people in Hawaii, you're looking for stuff that's going to pack well, ship well, as well as grow well in the backyard. So a uh, little bit different focus, but still. Um, you're not going to have repeat customers. Honest to God, when it first came out, I thought, wow, what's this African horn melon? This looks really cool. I bought one, I tried it, and I said, I'll never buy that again. Well, you know, you, you have a fruit that you think is the greatest from a marketing standpoint, but somebody eats it and says, I'm not going to eat that again. It doesn't do you a lot of good since you just planted a grove of it. So I'd prefer to plant uh, the ones that I know are, are going to be good. And clearly, seeds are a lot easier to transport and distribute and try than trying to get a hold of the graft material. And of course, after the fact, you can always go back and top work. So that's my two cents. Thanks, Robert. No, I agree. I, that's sort of my approach to mango right now. It's that, you know, these certain varieties may or may not produce really well in my location. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, I can always come back in and top work it. Um, there's a question uh, from Jordan regarding Atomoya, um, and he's looking at elevations. Um, 
who wants to take on that one? I just wrote him. Um, yeah, Jordan, basically from sea level, if it's protected from salt spray, we've had them as low as 50 feet here and, you know, maybe 200 yards from the water. And um, I've had them at, at 2,000 feet. So they're pretty durable. They just, to me, don't taste as good as Cherimoya or Rolinia or a good Atis, you know, sugar apple. So, I mean, I think for the most part, Atamoyas are, I mean, all the Nonas are, are pretty untested here, you know, in terms of varieties and elevations. You want to go back to, uh, to um, what you were saying, Mark, you know, so, so right now, <laughs> our plan for the first year uh, with avocados is that we're, we're taking a poll on the Facebook forum every two weeks of every avocado that people are harvesting. And they're sending me pictures of from perfect avocados to the trifecta, as Brian puts it, the, the trifecta of junk, Lance's favorite with stone cell strings and uh, a giant seed. Um, it, there's, so after we get an idea of every two weeks, which avocados are being harvested, then we can narrow it down next year. Okay, so we know in this two weeks, these were harvested. What elevation were they harvested at? What island were they harvested at? And try to narrow it down so that we can, at the end of two or three years, we can go and say, all right, from this elevation on Kauai, you can plant, you know, Romero from Lanai or Kahalu from, from uh, Kona or, or just to kind of, sort out the microclimates, at least for avocados, by elevation and island. And eventually, Tracy uh, Matsumoto from Peabark and I are trying to develop a, a system to reclassify avocados, where now they're currently divided by three races. But what I'd like to do is to to change that. So if we look at the early histories, which is why Robert, Paul, I'd love you to find that book. So we know that Hulumanu and Iliyahu were two of the first cultivars to come to Hawaii. And that most of these big light green avocados with teardrop shaped rattle seeds, we know that that started from Hulumanu. So that's its, you know, one category for Hawaii. And what started from Iliahu, and then we know Mr. Igami brought Daily Eleven and Oda and all these other things here in 1947 when he went to Ventura, California. So trying to find the origin of specific varieties and then the seedlings that have been named based on those um, is something that I'm trying to work on too. That is so much to do. All right, so Laurent has a question going back to our greenhouse. What are, what's our short list on um, plants or cultivars that um, we want to put in there? I, I know durian's definitely on that short list, but what are the others that you have on your short list? Well, the Bacaria um, species doesn't have to be in a greenhouse. There's no requirement for quarantine, but the way we've set up the, the environments and the humidity inside uh, the greenhouses that can simulate an environment from Borneo or North Queensland, uh, where Tampoy, for instance, thrive. Um, so maybe I'll put some into that room. Maybe I'll rent that room. Since HTFG owes me 50 some thousand dollars, I might as well take a room. Actually, I'm going to put a hot tub in one of the rooms and disco ball. And, never mind. Um, I, I think that it's really up to the membership beyond beyond durian and bacaria. I mean, there's a lot of things we don't have. I mean, Lance, what are you? Lance, you still here? Kimura. Well, I guess not. Ryder got the best of them. Um, I don't see him. He, He's, you know, if we can get the variants for the different mangoes, if we can get a variance for uh, some of the new Japanese citrus varieties, which 
can approach 50% bricks. I mean, they're just amazing. You cannot believe this is a citrus until you bite it, but it's so sweet. It's just, just totally amazing. So there's a lot of things out there that we can have access to if we can get permission to get them in. So, um, you know, we, we got uh, real Dacopan now in Shikwasa that were here, but they were before the quarantine and before greening was here, but they were, we had to get them through convoluted means from, the Cal from California and Maui. For instance, the USD asked me, how'd you get Shikwasa in Hawaii? Did you bring it in illegally? No, the mayor of Maui brought it in 35 years ago and there's a huge tree at his house and his sister-in-law gave it to him. So they don't know how things got here or who got here, but you know, as long as we can get them and propagate them, that's, and distribute them to our repositories. Now we got a place to do things. And, you know, Robert and I have just been working with uh, the bush tucker fruit, the Australian fruit. So there's a great uh, potential here for some of these things. You know, for our, arguably our, our best markets are chefs. And um, they just went nuts for O'Ray or Davidsonian plum. But there's a lot of other bush tucker fruit that we don't have here that we can use the greenhouse for that is already being grown for me in Queensland by Peter Solaris's folks. So great potential. Does that answer that, Lauren? I mean, I'd like to hear what else people wanna, wanna grow. So uh, what would you like to see brought in? Anybody, Robert, Paul, what do you want to see here growing? I think that's one of the things we will be serving the membership on. Um, the, with this new website and this new database, we should be able to get much more interaction with the membership. Yep, agreed. I don't see any more questions. Um, we have, for those of you that have just come in, we have, we're up to 30 participants now. Um, we're using the chat for questions as much as possible and, and we're trying to mute people when they're not speaking to keep the noise down. Um, looks like Lauren has another question about anything from Europe that might be of value for us here. Uh, any kind of crops out of Europe? Well, only Lauren, only the tempered crops. Um, you know, figs, uh, pomegranates to me have always been questionable here. They've never really done well. Um, we've tested 50 or 60 thanks to John Priest's people at the USDA in California. Um, there's, um, I just don't think it's a crop worth taking space on. If you have one, what I call uh, Hanai, not, you know, not as in family, but as it's a Japanese name, um, is one pomegranate that fruits regularly. We've tried all the others and you get occasional fruit here and there, but it's just not worth the space. If you're thinking in terms of production agriculture, for, for uh, figs, yeah. Figs have extremely uh, high value and extremely uh, good um, chance for marketing. Plus they're good for value added products. Um, but overall, a lot of the European fruit um, I, is, is it, we just don't have the cold chill. If they opened up farms at 5,000 and higher up the mountains, yeah, we could grow more European type uh, plums and, and, and what have you. Does that answer your question, Laurent? Um, okay. Looking for more questions. Anybody? In terms of one of the things, I'll add something. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get active uh, repositories on each of the islands. And um, Kona's 
doing really well with with their work but i think all of the all the other chapters the, the getting these repositories functioning to the point where they have a lot of uh, plant material and, and they can disperse the plant material is still a long ways off and, and it's going to take some more effort on everybody's part so i'd like to encourage everybody to kind of check in with their their local repositories and, and help out when they can I think Molokai has done a, an incredibly good job with theirs, and they're very active. Uh, and they have repository work days every every month or so. Um, the the one at the National Tropic Botanic Garden on on Kauai uh, is just is gorgeous. I mean, I look at it. And, I mean, those are the trees we planted two years ago, and they're thriving. The ones that made it. So thanks to um, Alex there and our Kauai members. I mean, Rob Rosen was there working, our fo the former president. A couple weeks ago, Umi's down the street, goes once in a while. So um, Kauai's doing really good too. Uh, Lanai, Dave Embry has got everything in the ground and we keep sending him things and, and it's thriving inside the, the um, ag lands on, on, on Lanai there on his property. In fact, so much so that He's looking at getting additional property to plant more of a selection. And already the, the Lanai members are, are, are sending me things. Should we plant my family avocado there? And they send me this avocado that's the size of my head, you know, which called Romero, which I'd never had before. So um, I think they're over all the repositories. Actually, it's the mother repository in Kona at my place that does well, but uh, Chantel needs some volunteers down at that where Jordan came and built a trellis there, which still isn't planted. Um, Brian needs some help on in Hilo, although we are looking at another uh, a, a second location in Hilo that's uh, Mackay in a less rainy area. So we keep uh, working on it and expanding it as uh, um, as needed. Okay, we got a couple of questions came, coming in now. So Noah's asking, um, looking at core infrastructure needs to improve flow of fruits to market. This might be a one for Robert Paul. Maybe you can start with that, Robert. I have the question again, please. So the question is, what are the infrastructure improvements that are needed to improve the flow of fruit to market? You know, by, by some miracle, we got the state to put up a few million dollars in capital improvement projects, you know, like what, you know, what's the number one or two things we could invest in in Hawaii to, to you know, infrastructure wise to, to support, um, yeah, the market of tropical fruits. I'd love to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, Rob, Rob, what you're thinking, I'll throw something in. And I've been noticing these fruit hub networks that are coming up around Oahu. I think those things are phenomenal because they're great aggregators. They'll pick up a little grower here and a little grower there and they'll pull them all together and they network really well. I, I think it's, I think that's a major breakthrough. Um, and just make sure those guys are adequately supplied with infrastructure for storage and, and, and material. So I know they're getting boxes to help these guys. They have people that can go out and pick at different people's farms that need the help. So I think that that informal network that's created as a result of these fruit hubs, I think is one of the tickets that's really making a big difference. That's just my observation. I would Eddie. like to somewhat make a uh, caution about building storage facilities and the reason is they cost money and they have to be maintained and that costs money. In some circumstances they do have a role but you want to have a product, most of our tropical products don't keep very well and the biggest thing you can do is move the product as quickly as possible, particularly if you have as, as, as Mark pointed out a good accumulator. If you want something which would have a much more general impact, I would suggest you need to create some sort of recycling plastic bin system where you can provide sterile things which will go most of the way through the system so that you don't have to repack, you don't have to move stuff around. 
these systems work in circumstances where you have um, a, a defined market. So that most of our stuff doesn't go outside of the state, so that's good. But getting rid of using use boxes is a major uh, achievement. If you can have sterile or, or, or washed clean plastic bins, not deep bins, but shallow bins for moving mm -hmm. stuff around. Partic and there are some larger growers who are doing that for some fruits and vegetables in Oahu, but it only goes to the wholesaler. And the reason is we don't have a way of re recovering the bins from the retailer. Uh, and therefore you have to get a wholesaler who will move the stuff out. Uh, but a number of growers are doing that already for fruits and vegetables on Oahu. So they'll take the stuff to the wholesaler in the bins which we use from the field all the way through. And then they'll pick the bins up at the wholesaler. But they're plastic, they're rigid boxes, they don't have sharp edges. They can be easily cleaned and treated with Clorox or, or which is not allowed unless you have a proper thing, but um, some sort of sterilization treatment. So you don't have a situation where you have potential for mechanical injury. So uh, okay there. Anyway. But storage facilities are something you might need, but they cost money. And if you don't have it running 60, 70% full most of the time, then you've got a problem of cost. Uh, just as Ken has pointed out his glass house issue, you know, to make a profit or to keep that thing running is gonna cost you a certain amount of need to have a certain amount of product in there for a fixed amount of time. And, and I think that's where we need people who are into agribusiness and can do budgets on these things to determine it. I mean, I've been on grants and consulting jobs and people have looked at the United States system and the large storage facilities which we have in various cities. And they say, oh, that's what we need. And, but the cost is that astronomical. Uh, to give you an example, I once saw in Jakarta in the main market, the old one, a brand new facility put up by the Dutch or the, and they paid for it. But they hadn't run it for nearly two and a half years. And the only thing that was in there were two pallets of coconuts. Uh, but that was a facility which worked on thinking, oh, we need storage space, we need refrigeration. Yes, you might, but you want to look very closely at the cost benefit analysis of that. I don't want to be negative, and I think it depends on the circumstance and it depends on the product amount uh, that you want to look at. And it's not a simple, oh, yes, that would be good. If you had reasonable facilities to move a product quickly, you would be better off. Uh, now, the example I would give in this circumstance would be Taiwan. Taiwan's a small market. Uh, it's got 20 million people but they tend to try and avoid going into coal storage or any refrigeration. Their objective is to move a product from the farm to the markets within 24 or 36 hours. That is their claim. And so you'll have essentially open markets which are regulated in the sense that you can't just bring product in unless it meets certain requirements you also may get tested for pesticides, which is a simple assay which costs around five to ten dollars each and can be done in 20 minutes. But this is common in that sort of circumstance, it's also used to some extent in Korea. But again, it's let's move the product. If it's going to be shipped out of the state, that's a different system. Um, so I can speak for the well, both the radiator in, in Hilo and the one and in Kunir have storage facilities, but they may only be holding the product for 24 to maybe 72 hours at the most. And, and because it's in a box, the center of that box may not get down to temperature for about another two or three 
through three days. So you've got to bear in mind that some of these boxes don't cool down as well, particularly since we're required to seal them to prevent reinfection with um, fruit flies. I raved on too much. It's Friday <laughs> yeah. today, and I'm going to go and have a beer later. So, if yeah, you're no, but, but thanks for that perspective. I mean, the yeah, I mean that's just a really good, I think, overall message of yeah, just get it to market. <laughs> um, I think Noah, but I, I would have never thought of the bins. I thought that's. Uh, I think what you have created on on the Big Island with the Ulu Cooperative, you and your people, and Donna. I think that's a, a, a good model. Having been with the coffee cooperative and working in that environment since uh, 82 I, or 81, I can say that, that this is the first cooperative I've seen that works. Um, that's not based on uh, personal needs, vendetta, need, you know, whatever it is. It, it, it seems to be for the industry and focused on for the industry and that's, that's one of the most important things. But I'd like to see that model used for avocados, used for, yeah, Makaha can do that for mangoes. It doesn't matter if it's a company or a cooperative, although there's certain advantages to either one um, and disadvantages to either one. But uh, the cooperative model is something that, that works. But as Bob pointed out, the infrastructure is cost prohibitive. I mean, I, I think that we have to get serious and the legislature has to get serious uh, about it. Uh, every time I'm at a, at, a, at a meeting with the legislature, I can just hear, hear Mark's brain thinking, oh, there he goes again. But we need to charge five cents a pound on inspection fee on everything that comes in here uh, that is grown here already, including coffee, you know, mangoes from Peru, whatever it is. And if I use the 2008 statistics uh, from the USDA for the imports of the things we grow here, that's $41 million a year that would come directly to add. You can pay for a few inspectors with 41 million. Hell, I'd even work for 41 million. Um, the point being is that it's better than the 0.1% of the state budget we get now you know, which is something like 3 million, um, plus container fees is a 1.2 million. So, you know, we, we, if we want to get ag to the place where it needs to be, we, we have to get serious about it. We have to have some serious inspections, not, you know, like the, the roadblock driving between California and Arizona. You know, if, if we, um, once we do that, we can we can start to see some change. Okay, I'll shut up, Mark. Okay, so Nat's got a question on avocado lace bugs, lace wings, lace bugs. Who's on that one? Mark Wright. No, no, Nat Blader is asking questions about yeah. the avocado lace wing. Mark, where's Mark? He, did he leave? No, I'm here. What's the question? I, I didn't see it. Oh, okay. avocado lace wing. Lace bug. Um, I guess the question is if there's any known biocontrol from where they're native. Is that, that that's Nat's question? Yeah, yeah. well, they've 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 come here to Hawaii now, and yeah, what's the biocontrol? Oh, I'm well aware of that. Uh, it was actually in my presentation a little bit as well. So they're so where they're where they're originally from the Caribbean and perhaps South Florida and so on. There are a couple of um, wasps that parasitize their eggs there. <clears throat> um, the thing with these is that they're typically, they're not necessarily very specific, so it's very hard to import them. Um, I think California are looking at prospects right now. Um, there are also um, generalist predators around, and I think they're quite efficient down in the place of origin. We also have some of those species here. Um, uh, you know, I mean, they, they have some impact. It's hard to tell what. Um, and there's, there's, there's essentially no likelihood that that any generalist will be brought into Hawaii, by the way. So, I mean, if they have an effective generalist predator in, in wherever the place of origin, wherever they find it, it's very, very unlikely it would ever be brought here because of non-target concerns. I think the biggest um, hope is that there are those egg parasitoids. They're um, tiny little wasps that parasitize the eggs. Um, and some of those are effective 
in other systems. Um, we actually have a native parasitoid in, in the one family, the family My Maridae, that parasitizes reasonably closely related insects. It's fairly generalist, so potentially with time it could move on to um, avocado lace bug. I don't know. It, it unexpectedly did that with um, two spotted uh, leaf hopper, for example, which is relatively closely related. So I think that's pretty much the answer. Yeah, they are. They are natural then, enemies in the place of origin, but I think the chances of them being brought here are small. But the, the um, uh, this is Ken. Uh, Mark, the, uh, the lacewing that that's infects white sapote, for example, um, it can defoliate a large white sapote tree. Although the tree, uh, the bigger it is, the faster it comes back, you know, with a vengeance. So, um, has there been any studies on how the other lacewing that affects uh, uh, more inclined to, to avocado, is there any studies out there that show the reaction of the tree to uh, infestation from avocado lacewing? Uh, lace bug. Lace wings are, are the good guys. Um, very little, actually. I can, um, okay. So, you know, they've looked in um, Florida. It's a, you know, it's a occasional pest out there because there's things that suppress it, I guess. And uh, California, they're trying to figure out what the, what the story is. I think, uh, I think tree stress has a lot to do with susceptibility to the damage. If you have trees that are stressed for some reason, they're going to be more susceptible to that damage. Vice versa, if you have a high infestation of lace bug, it could place severe stress on, on an already stressed tree, and you might, it might then become susceptible to... Um, shot hole borers, little beetles that burrow yeah. into, the, into the wood now and, and can kill the tree. Um, so, you know, an, an unstressed tree is probably going to be quite resistant, but a stressed tree, I think, is going to be susceptible to both lace bug damage and to secondary subsequent things that follow that, like shot hole borers. Um, yeah. Nat, you want to ask a more question, Dara? Are you on? Yeah, I hear you. Go ahead, Nat. I didn't. I didn't catch because uh, there's some noise in the background where the lace bug is native to. Oh, it's from the Caribbean and um, I think South Florida. Um, over there, uh, I think it occurs in Texas, perhaps. Um, Bad because of the super hot summer. Sorry, are you asking trees. if it's really bad now this summer because it's very hot? Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, the, the greater the tree stress, the, the worse the damage is going to be. Well, the worse the reaction to the damage is going to be. Yeah, as, as Ken was saying earlier, lace bugs often feed on things and don't cause dramatic damage. Um, I, I, I think it's the presence of stresses like droughts and um, shot hole borers that are making this thing really bad. I don't know if you're all aware of the shot hole borer issue, but these are little beetles that burrow into the into the stems and they cause these little cones so it's like a little it's like a little volcano that gets pushed out and once they're inside they physically stress the plant but they also transmit pathogens into the plant and eventually it will die from those so i think that's exacerbated by this bug so we find On the affected avocado trees i'll keep an eye out for it yeah this yeah. thing is to spray uh, safer soap for for less you know i mean it's a straightforward simple thing if you can get the coverage it's useful We find the borers in um, avocado seeds have increased dramatically over the past few years. And if I, if I don't catch it and destroy that seed and I plant a seed, you know, that I'm later going to graft, I find that, you know, after six months when I go to cut the top for grafting, you can see it's black in the middle of the stem and you can see the effect of the, on the plant already from just the borers inside the seeds. And then if you break that seed open, you can see the damage to the embryo where it, it's enough where it'll still grow, but you can't, you can't graft onto it. It'll never survive. So it's uh, the borers are, are, you know, I think that's the cause of a lot of the macadamia nut decline too, are shot hole borers and on coffee twig hole borers. And a lot of those borers I think have migrated to uh, citrus and some of the other things that we, see damage on um, the, the particular borer that's causing a problem uh, its scientific name is you fornicatus 
Mm-hmm. If you translate that into into English, it's a, I probably can't say that in a public forum, but uh, it's a, <laughs> it suggests that it's a bit of a whore of an insect. Right. <laughs> And yeah, it is. I mean, these things go on to some 260 some species of plants uh, here and other places in the world. That it's dramatic how they they're um, uh, becoming suddenly more and more important. Um, yeah. And things like macadamia felted cocks that I think stress trees to the point that um, that that these things are able to actually kill the tree eventually. Yeah. So it's something that a lot of us are working on. We're looking for biocontrol for those currently, together with guys from UC Riverside. Great, thanks. Well, I don't know about great, but. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm starting to get a lot of questions here, so I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. So Nat, you had a question about, was it Pindaiba? You know what that is, Nat? Yeah, yeah if, we can get, if we can get some, Nat, and get a source from, for either uh, trees that have been grown out, small trees that have been grown out or seeds. Yeah, there's no reason why we can't uh, get that to uh, Ecuador, which would be the, uh, the point of uh, pickup and where the phyto would come from for, for uh, export. Okay, I got a so Only so when I knew who had a tree. Actually, I think, uh, Frankie's has Pindaiba on his, uh, he has it in his farm, but then he hasn't, he's had it for like over 10 years, 15 years, and he hasn't gotten the fruit yet. So I kind of wonder if there are some climate issues or maybe even he, it's not rainy enough, even in Waimanalo for him to get it to fruit, but he only has one tree though either. So I don't know um, what's the deal with that, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't, check it on it every day to see if maybe he missed flowers or whatever but um any case it's it's here but i haven't heard anyone fruiting it yet anyway so jordan's got a question and, and i kind of like your thinking jordan it says you know what new fruit would have the highest yielding nutritional value and i think i would couple that with the highest level of production uh, maybe that might be part of the criteria we'll have to look at as we look at new crops. Um, but given that question about nutritional value, what would come to, up on the list? Who would be able to answer that question? Yeah, I, I think you've got egg fruit, which has the fi- highest vitamin A, acerola, which has the vitamin, highest vitamin C. So a lot of this already exists here. Abiu has a weird combination of amino acids that build walls around the herpes simplex virus. So we, we have some uh, in, in incredibly good fruits here. Not to say that there's not others, but um, from, from the two to three, somewhere between two and 300 plants that I've written pages on, um, those uh, come to mind and are already here. Now there are some, you know, so many highly unusual species in, uh, in, uh, you know, other parts of the world that like when we were working on the uh, bush tucker fruit in Australia, we found all the nutritional aspects of them, but there's, and they're, they're healthy and well balanced and some have a, you know, more iron or more ash or more vitamin A, but that doesn't mean that they have as much as some of the things we already have like canistel or star apple or what have you. So when you find one, uh, Jordan, give me the name and tell me where it's from and I'll, we'll try to get it in. So what we can do and is to, like in South America is, is, is gang fruit from different countries. Like I'd like to have some, some leucoma genetics that are much better than the, the, the leucoma that UH brought in in the 50s that's still growing and producing in Kainalio. Uh, but there's there's better leucoma out there, which is also an extremely uh, valuable source of, of vitamin A. Um, I think that uh, getting uh, getting things from South America and packaging them in Ecuador and sending them back with one Fido and maybe 50, 60 boxes inside one shipment uh, so that there's no chance of cross-contamination between each little box. Um, is the way we have to have to do it. So just find out a source for what you want and I'll get them. 
Okay, we got another question. This is kind of a question from Sol Chung. It's asking with climate uh, changes, what what kind of variations or what impact might we have on planting of fruit trees with, with all this climate change? Anybody? Well, I think we got to be more um, aware of uh, drought tolerant plants. You know, I think that, um, you know, looking at things like uh, figs and uh, pomegranate, some of the pomegranates that do produce here, um, and as it gets drier, uh, it'll get better. And even mangoes, if, if you think about things and at low elevation, date palms. I have huge boxes of dates drying out in my, in my um, garage right now uh, from, from a date palm at uh, low elevation. So these are things, and if we look at a, a, a typical Mediterranean climate where we've got daytime, it's 100 and some degrees, and nighttime, it's 50 some degrees, um, if the climate change goes in that direction for us, there are fruits that thrive in that, in those conditions, you know, like these, like blood orange, for example, and some citrus. And there's other trees that as long as they get enough water, they're going to thrive in any, uh, any condition. So, I mean, you know, and, and as last resort, we look at Japan where they grow mangoes in Hokkaido in greenhouses with three feet of snow outside and they get two crops a year. So there's no reason why if they can control the environment, we can control the environment too. So, but there's no infrastructure to do that. You build a greenhouse in Japan, the, the national government pays 50%, the prefectural government pays uh, 20%, and you only have to come up with 30%. So when, when our people get serious about agriculture, when they're forced to get serious about agriculture, that's one of uh, the projects that we can lay on them like our greenhouse, but everybody should have these greenhouses, not necessarily for import, but for growing things inside. You know, growing food for the public or, or growing new trees out. So. Wow, Matt, I haven't seen a necktie in years. <laughs> okay, Mark. Yeah, I have some food? more. Okay, Sue, does that answer your um, question at all? Where'd Sue go? She's coming in. She's yeah. coming right now. She's going to unmute. Yeah, there she is. Yes, thank you. I, I'd also talked to a woman from Hilo who said that she, her lychee was fruiting when it had never fruited before because things at higher elevations were starting to fruit. Um, and she felt it was because of changes in the climate. So I, I wondered if others are observing the same thing. I think in the case of lychee, a lot of it's due to stress. Lychee in Hilo is used to a lot of rain and there we got the rain in Kona this year. So I had 32 inches of rain last year. This year I'm over 100 inches already. So those kinds of differences, whether it's due to the volcano stopping or just some weird seasonal thing or uh, you know, a general climate change, uh, that's something that I have to cope with and deal with. So we'll see what happens next year if it goes back to 27 or 32 inches or it stays around 100 inches. If it stays around 100 plus, it'll probably be 130 inches by the end of the year. If it stays like that, I have to rethink some of my more drought tolerant trees like figs that don't like that. I was wondering if anyone had thoughts on how it impact coffee and cacao. Because um, I'd read an article about how Starbucks was um, planning for climate change by having their own farms and doing their own research. Yeah. Sorry, what was the question related to cacao? I didn't catch the beginning. And that, I was just asking about how coffee and cacao might be impacted by climate change in Hawaii. Um, given that Starbucks is doing their own research for climate change resilient okay. coffee. We had a climate change researcher, Lucas Fortini, did some 
um, maps of where cacao can grow feasibly in Hawaii currently and uh, in a hundred years with expected climate change with and without irrigation. And it definitely shrinks significantly the amount of good growing land for cacao in Hawaii for sure, since it's such a water hungry plant. Um, so yeah, it will definitely have an impact. There are sort of scare articles every year about you know, reduced cacao because of climate change. Um, but I think they kind of tend to be alarmist. And I had to break it up. Plant. That's Jeanette. And it's just like back and forth. Um, Matt, you're breaking um, up. I, I think so it's going to be similar. Yeah, I'm getting out of cell phone okay. range. Yep. Sorry. I, I mean, I think coffee and cacao are going to be similar, you know, to any other fruit tree. Um, they have a um, temperature range where they thrive. They have a, a temperature and water or humidity range where they thrive, and they have one where they don't. And so if we can't change the environment they're in, we have to look at alternatives or we have to uh, clone specific trees that, that might be different, might thrive in that environment. You know, um, look at as much as they, they'll throw things at me here in Kona, look at other varieties of coffee that thrive in different uh, varieties or thrive in different climates rather. And, and I suspect, you know, with the different types of cacao and other theobromas like kupuasu and, and, and um, bicolar, I think there's um, uh, 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 possibilities that to provide marketable crops from a wide range of climates as they change back and forth, that makes sense. I mean, I've seen, seen them in four, next year, it'll be 40 years. I've been work, I've worked in Japan and studied in Japan and just the cherry trees from 40 years ago. And today it's about a six week difference of when they bloom and have the Hanami parties. It used to be mid April. Now it's the beginning of March. And so to see that's my best example of experiencing climate change, but those trees will bear with it and they'll thrive in any condition, but they're, the seasons will change. When we're picking coffee, we're picking coffee now. We never used to pick coffee until November here. So there's a, there's a change in, you know, a month or so change in when the coffee picking season has started. So, but the trees are, are pretty adaptable to that, if that makes sense. Okay, Mark. Okay, so um, we got a question again from Jordan. He's looking at maybe these food hubs, um, looking at commercial production or commercial processing. And um, so that's something that maybe we might be looking at. Well, yeah, we're almost finished with the certified kitchen here. I mean, ultimately it'd be nice if each repository had a, had a building and a kitchen too for a community kitchen. Um, which is our, we're experimenting with here with the Master Food Preservers, which is now just a, a spin-off and its own 501c3. So I don't have to write grants that compete against each other. But Jordan, you've got the best facility in the state there with the Maui Food Innovation Center. It's not a food hub, but when you have a plan, talk to Chris Spear, say, hey, if we have a farmer's market on campus here, can people buy it and use the kitchen or use the, and I, I don't know what that people can use as kitchen if they've gone through a specific program there or uh, uh, Hawaii Master Food Preservers or, um, you know, one of the other, one of the other programs. Like I'm saying, well, Raven, Raven's on here. She was, uh, she's a Master Food Preserver. And Paul Felipe, who's not here, is a Master Food Preserver. So, um, 
you know, it's a, it's a, a viable program there where we certify people uh, pretty much statewide except the Wahoo uh, because you can't get funding there. Everything goes to your train. Um, but anyway, Jordan, I'm not sure if that really answers your your question, but the program is, you know, eight full days. It teaches uh, jarring, canning, high pressure canning, freezing, freeze drying, pickling, fermenting, everything you can imagine to take any kind of food product and preserve it. Okay. All right, looks like, uh, okay, Mark, you gotta go or? Yeah, all right. Uh, so I think, um, let's see, I'm looking for questions in here. It looks like some more big picture issues, um, you know, getting funding for lace bug treatment. That's a matter of lobbying the Department of Ag and working on that. Um, I will say regarding this, um, uh, commercial and, and actually food processing. That's one of the takeaways coming out in this environment. People are, are doing a lot more homework um, and they're making jams and jellies. I, I see them all over the place and it's just a matter of building the expertise within our community. So the master food preserver program that we started before, I think is something that will probably continue. There's people making breads or people drying fruit. Um, there's a lot of that stuff and it's just got to make, um, I guess it's got to make sense and you got to have it available for more people, but the facilities are there. I think we have to just lead the way, lead by example. And there's good examples out there. I always like the idea of having an annual competition or an annual festival to kind of showcase what people are doing. And that's something I'd, I'd like us to kind of institute and have an annual event just to show what people are doing. I don't see any more questions from anyone. We're getting close to uh, the 11, 11 o'clock hour. Can I ask a verbal question? Go ahead. Um, has there been any talk about us go, getting together and getting like a, a, a giant freeze dryer that we could we could use? Is that is that topic come up? There is a giant freeze dryer on Molokai in the Lanakia kitchen that hasn't been used, and it's huge, huge. Not freeze dryer, sorry, but dehydrator. Um, we've run some tests here. In fact, Dave uh, Duche is doing our website, has run a number of tests on freeze dried food, freeze, there, freeze dried fruit, can't talk well. Um, and well, you know, I've had 10 different things that were freeze dried and I'll stick to dehydrated. I think there's more taste there. Especially the way uh, Jane, who's the Vice President of Master Food Preservers, dehydrates and not just cuts fruit and derives it, but all of the fruit are either soaked or macerated or cooked down and then dehydrated or dehydrated raw and mixed together with other juice. I mean, it's a, the combinations are, are what makes it special. So, you know, though, the, the, de, um, the freeze drying, though, preserves a lot of the terpenes, which are lost. When you, when you dehydrate, you usually use heat and you lose a lot of your, your special flavors and smells. Um, in, in some cases, but that's why she goes through these other processes to lock that in. Uh, more vitamin oriented than smell oriented, but... Um, yeah, I mean, there's ways there's ways around that. One of the issues with freeze drying, besides the loss of aroma volatiles, is that you your packaging becomes a critical issue. Uh, you need to have bags which have very low permeability to water, otherwise your product goes off very quickly. And so this bagging operation, which also generally involves injecting nitrogen or some other gas in, no water um, is critical. And those are those aluminium eyes plastic bags, which have low water and oxygen transmission rates, and they're not cheap. 
per se. You can get them out of Southeast Asia, but uh, as you realize when you buy freeze drive, and even if it's only 25 grams, um, you're paying quite a lot of money. So not only is the operation of freeze drying a, 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 an art in itself, it's this packaging and, dis, and retaining the, the product to, to the market, is, it needs to be considered. Thanks, you guys. Good answers. <laughs> Okay, this is our five minute warning. Last five minutes. I, I like what um, Mark Wright said about the monetary impacts of lace bug. I mean, there's monetary impacts by all of the, the insects to all of our fruit. And yeah, a lot of research is required and with um, you know, funding losses, I mean, going back to uh, T-STAR and some of the other programs that UH participated in, they, you guys lost a lot of money that could have be put to not just positions, but into real research projects. Um, people need to, to understand that, that um, it's a problem. And let's see, there's Eric's question about Department of Ag on money, we need to transfer the stories to actual farmers impacted. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do, Eric, there's no question about it. But, you know, every time I pose that 5% import fee, you can't tax interstate commerce. I'm not taxing, I wanna inspect it, like California inspects everything coming in. You know, and Arizona inspects everything coming in. Texas inspects everything coming in. So why can't we inspect things coming in and not just being denied being able to send something out? So that's why I keep pushing durian because there's no pest risk assessment required. It's free. You can send it like pineapple and papaya, you know, to your friends on the mainland. Imagine at home Christmas morning and you open a box of durian. Of course, you would have known what it was for ages, but it, it's, it's got um, a considerable potential. But this $41 million, every time it's posted, every time there's a newspaper story about it, the trolls come out. My God, poor people will never be able to eat. Well, friggin' Matson just raised their young brother's 49% increase in shipping. Nobody's complaining about that. But I asked for 5%, you know, for inspection fees and everybody bitches about it. So there's a, you know, a priority difference that we, we need to contend with within the legislature. Mark, would you run for governor if Josh doesn't and just get it over with already? Look, doesn't he look like a governor in that picture? We can all, we can all run, we can all run, but we won't get elected. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, so I will. the two minute warning. Any other questions? Oh, then we can leave early. Lance, you missed, you were gone, Lance, when I talked about you before. Um, oh, God, why? Um, just, you know, when we were talking about some of the plants that we might want to bring in that have a potential economic impact for the growers here, things to go in the greenhouse. Oh. Some of the different things that you, I know you collect a lot of rare things and and get seeds from all over and get them started and distributed. And it's oh. a great asset to growers statewide. Uh, I told you about Maprong not needing a um, quarantine, right? Um, I don't remember, but that's good to know. Yeah, because it might- don't realize it's a mango, huh? Yeah, but there's not enough cases to like, deem it as a risk. So you can actually import it direct if you have the right documentation without uh, Phyto, but now I have to find a grower in Thailand that can provide me clean products. So that's the challenge. So I think I need oh, to go. You have to, to go and clean it yourself with a fungicide and toothbrush. Yeah. But the question I gotta is, go. yeah, I got to go Thailand and do it. So. We'll yeah. See. How about more? I mean, will they give you a phyto in Thailand for them? Uh, I know people. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck yeah, with we'll, that. So yeah. I want a thousand of them for one of the rooms. <laughs> you can have one or two after three years. 
Oh, cool, cool. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I'll pay for the trees. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, it's 11, it's 11 oh. o'clock. I'd like to encourage everyone to go onto our website and stay active. Be looking out for more emails. Uh, and more videos. And videos, yes. Anything else, Ken? You want to parting words? Um, yeah, I just really appreciate everybody's uh, participation in this, even if, if you didn't say anything like Sally we thank you for being here and smiling and that I see your little picture up there and you're always smiling through this whole thing so thank you for that uh, Matt Binder thanks again for all your work on getting the videos together and um, I don't know hey everybody thank you very much bye thank you Hasta la vista, baby. Anyway, stay safe. Thank you very much, Mark and Ken, for organizing this and the whole conference. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I like this format where people have two weeks and if they want to watch what they watch and then we feel obligated to do a small live thing there, I think that that's a good choice too. Two hours is even, it's tolerable for all of us, right? Thanks, and it's Rob, even better because you can mute all the people who talk too much. Yeah. Would you mute Matt, please, Robert? <laughs> Robert, thanks for hosting. Okay, everyone. Bye. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon at the board meeting. And Robert, get me a case of books. See ya. Robert Paul, that was, not Bradford. <laughs>